Welcome back. You're listening to Across the Border, a Prophecy Reality Edition. And as WW uh, in the chat room says, more book reading, I think. <laughs> it goes beyond uh, book reading, I guess, uh, some commentary to go along with it. But we are going through a history of apocalyptic interpretation in the second hour until we get through with the book. And... Uh, so I hope everyone's enjoying the broadcast. I don't want to give you too much of uh, one thing at one time because I put this on YouTube videos and I break it up. Uh, uh, this will be broken up into three separate videos. Uh, the first hour and two smaller videos and then the second hour will be uh, part, whatever part we are in uh, History of Apocalyptic Interpretation. Okay. And, uh, gee, where were, where were I? I can't even remember now, but we were going through it. And it says page 30 conclusion on my post-it note up here. So hopefully I have that all set up. Okay. Did I get it? Yeah. Well, I'm on page 30. So that must be where I'm at. And it says conclusion. Um, so anyway, I hope everyone's enjoying this. As I said, it's, uh, one of the big problems today with the church, uh, evangelicals and Protest so-called Protestants, uh, who are no longer protesting and living up to the name as protest or witness, because that's what it means. The protest is a witness, okay? And we are called to witness. But part of our witness is the history of the church. And if we throw away the witness of the church for 2,000 years, as uh, the Protestants and ev evangelicals have done, well, then we wander around looking for something to believe in because we've forgotten our own history. And uh, we need to believe in the history of our church and God's word, which foretold the history of our church. So we look at the Revelation, we read it, and in those pages we see our own history, only we see it fulfilled and we know where we fit in that history. And that's what really what it's all about the historical or historicist uh, understanding and interpretation of the book of Revelation. So don't be confused about these things. Um, here we have it. Let me get this all on the page where we want it to be. And this is, uh, we're in on page 30, period one, St. John to Constantine. And we went through all of the writers in that era. Uh, exposed to us by E.B. Eliot, and E.B. Eliot, e. Eliot writes to us a conclusion. So let's switch over to that. And on the whole, in reviewing this earliest period of apocalyptic interpretation, the following points may remain in our minds as the most marked and important characteristics. First, that the apocalyptic figurations were supposed to be such as began to have fulfillment from the time of St. John or commencement of the Christian era. I believe there is no one expositor of the period under review that entertained the idea of the apocalyptic prophecy overleaping the chronological interval, were it less or greater, antecedent to the consummation and plunging at once into the times of the consummation and of the then expected Antichrist. See, for example, Irenaeus and Victorinus on the first seal, uh, Tertullian on the fifth seal, and also Methodius, and etc. And we covered that in our previous sessions. As regards the first seal and the interpretation of its white horse and horsemen by Irenaeus, and then Tertullian and Victorinus as symbolizing Christ's victories by the gospel, we have to note that though it is Victorinus who conjoins this, its explanation, with that of the contrasted horse and horseman of the next three seals as symbolizing the Bella Fames and Pestis that were to follow after the first gospel preaching and triumphs antecedently to Christ's second coming, so as predicted by Christ in Matthew 24, yet seems probable that Victorinus's predecessors, as well as his successors like him, 
combine this view of the first seal with that of the next three seals, and with similar reference to Christ's prophecy respecting those antecedents to his second coming. Which being so, and as this is a primary and cardinal point in ap apocalyptic interpretation, it will be well here to bear in mind Irenaeus's own caution expressed with reference to another of the apocalyptic mysteries, I mean the beast's name, that, if meant to be known at the time, it would doubtless have been declared by him who saw the revelation, as part and parcel of an interpretation of all the, first, the four first seals taken from Matthew 24, whereof the explanation of the next three seals, as symbolizing war, famine, and pestilence, constitutes another essential part. It is disproved at once by the impossibility of the third seal symbol, with its coinix of five pounds of barley for a denarius, together with the plenty of wine and oil, ever meaning famine. As to the great subject of Antichrist, while there was a universal concurrence in the general idea of the prophecy, there was in respect of the details of application a considerable measure of difference. These differences arising mainly out of certain current notions of the coming Antichrist as in some way Jewish as well as Roman and the difficulty of combining and adjusting the two characteristics. The Roman view followed, of course, apocalyptically from Antichrist being figured as the Roman beast's eighth head after the healing of his deadly wound. For all identified the beasts of, Re of Revelation 13 and 17 and joined also in the closest union with the seven-hilled harlot as well as from Daniel's depicting him as a little horn of the fourth or Roman beast. Of Antichrist's supposed Jewish connection, no apocalyptic evidence occurred to the early patristic expositors. Only that Irenaeus thought Dan's omission in Revelation 7 from the seeded tribes might arise from that being the Jewish tribe of Antichrist's origin. Mere speculation on his part. A notion, I believe, in which none followed him. The idea arose chiefly, doubtless, from vague expectation of his being a pseudo-Antichrist. And I write about a pseudo-Antichrist in my book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. And a pseudo-antichrist is one who would be put up to be the antichrist and put up by the actual antichrist. Think about that one for a while. Oh, Satan would never deceive us like that. Would a, the antichrist would deceive us as to his true character by trying to put someone else up. We can trust the antichrist, can't we? <laughs> and of course, I'm being facetious here. So continuing, the idea chiefly doubtless from a vague expectation of his being a pseudo-antichrist, such as Christ told of in Matthew 24, 5, the thought being that the Jews might receive this impersonator as their long-sought Messiah. This error was conjoined by some of the fathers as Irenaeus and Hippolytus, and with the idea that the abomination of desolation of which Christ then spoke, as predicted by Daniel, in the Jewish sanctuary was not only the one prophesied of in Daniel 9.27 as what would synchronize with the end of the 70 weeks, but that associated with Antichrist in the prophecy of Daniel 12.11 and the associated prediction which Matthew 24.5 refers to in Dan 11.36. Thus, the conclusion that the ending epoch of each an ending epoch also of the 70 weeks would be at the end of Antichrist three and a half years at the consummation. So you can see this error, that many errors that people are trying to blend in or have tried to blend in over the years with contemporary prophecy or end time eschatology and specifically with futurism, many of these ideas they read about by researching and uh, sought to blend them in and they become new and, and people are wowed by the ideas, uh, but 
they are as false today or as mistaken today as they were when the ideas were first thought of. Okay, was there not in the designation of the desolating abomination in Daniel 11.31 that which might serve to distinguish it from the desolating abomination of Daniel 11 and Daniel 9.27, that the latter be meant distinctively by Christ, not the former? This question is answered by the by other patristic expositors of the era, Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian, and I may add to Tatian, from Christ's death to the consequent desolation, and also Julius Africanus at the commencement of the third century, all explain Daniel's 70 weeks and their abomination of desolation as having had their accomplishment from Christ's death to the consequent desolation of Jerusalem. So there is the correct interpretation, and we see that from the beginning. We see the ideas of error being mixed in, but those expositors who are uh, coming to an agreement that the full accomplishment of Daniel's 70 weeks was from Christ's death to the consequent desolation by the Roman armies. And we talk about this in the book, if you get the book uh, from my website, When the Third Temple is Built, and also my previous book from 2014, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. Uh, you can get a line on that, or just stick around long enough, you'll get it. <laughs> what the uh, historicist position is. Okay. And so having no reference whatsoever to any desolation by the then future Antichrist, which can only be speculation, I'll add. Nor of the few who, with Irenaeus and Hippolytus, referred the last Hebdomad, and that's the last seventh period or last 70th week, and its abomination and desolation to the end of the world and Antichrist. Do I find that in any but Hippolytus expounded the 70th and last Hebdomad as broken off from the preceding 69 by a great chronological gap. Certainly no such gap is spoken of by Irenaeus and Apollonius of Laodicea, who lived a century and a half later under Valens, made the 70 weeks to have had commencement with Christ's first advent, and so to come down continually to the to an epoch 490 years later. And so you see what they were trying to do there, saying that the 70 weeks commenced with Christ and that the end of the world would be 490 years from then. Obviously a mistaken idea, which he expected might be the, see there's a lot of footnotes in this book you're going to miss in this exposition, the time of Antichrist coming and the consummation, so might some such view very possibly have been that by which Irenaeus referred to the last week to the consummation. I refer not to Judas Cyrus, another earlier writer on the subject mentioned by Eusebius, because now he managed to make the period of the 70 weeks end nearly at his own epoch with the 10th the of Severus, uh, or about A.D. 203, does not appear, though I infer from Eusebius's words that he too computed continuously. So they were continuously looking at the scripture, like a lot of people do today. I get emails weekly from people telling me that the rapture is going to happen next week, or that this, you know, this you know, the conjunction of the stars, or the next Hebrew feast on the calendar. And it, the, the same people just continually, they, they don't stop and think, gosh, you know, I've been wrong. <laughs> Maybe I'm not looking at this properly. But they continue on. I send these people free copies of my book. I email, you know, them texts and sections of my book explaining how they're wrong and trying to point them into the direction of the historical interpretation that is taught by the scripture itself. Uh, yeah. So uh, that's the one I'm going to go with, one that is demonstrated, the method of interpretation that is demonstrated in the scripture itself. I'll stick with that. Okay. Moving on here to page uh, 35. 
Reverting to those early expositors, notice about Antichrist, let me observe further that in regard to his religious profession, though the expectation of its being Judaism was prevalent among them, yet the idea was also ever kept up, an idea derived from St. John's epistles, that heretics professedly within the church might be considered also as antichrists. Moreover, that when the great and chief antichrist came, he would sedulously affect external resemblances to Christ, agreeably with the lamb-like apocalyptic symbol. Such a notion as that of a professedly atheistic or infidel antichrist was as yet unknown. Again, as to Antichrist's Roman connection, while all admitted this, and thus the pseudo Sibyl and Victorinus spoke of him as the resuscitated Emperor Nero, and also Irenaeus, and yet more strongly Hippolytus, suggest that he, he might very probably on this account have for his name and number Latianus. Yet then, and thereupon, their views differed, for the pseudo Sibyl and Irenaeus thought that he would be prominent in Rome's destruction, transferring its empire to Jerusalem. Hippolytus, on the contrary, that he would be the restorer of the Roman Empire in a new form, somewhat like a second Augustus, to which his opinion I must again beg my reader's special attention. The rather, because while expressing it, I find from the original Greek, he had the more usual reading before him in Revelation 17, 16 of, and uh, he goes into a Greek phrase there, as, uh, as his Latin translation first seen by me represents it. The reading adopted is temporary burning from which the beast would in a new form next resuscitate it and quite distinct from the everlasting fire God described in Revelation 18 as its subsequent and final doom. On the apocalyptic Babylon's meaning, Rome all agreed. They all agreed that Rome was the apocalyptic Babylon. And I'll say that has carried on through all the historicists or all the Reformed Fathers uh, till this very day. Uh, Rome all agreed. They all agreed that Rome was the apocalyptic Babylon. And I'll say that has carried on through all the historicists or all the Reformed Fathers uh, till this very day. Uh, we see Rome today in the form predicted by the Word of God as broken into pieces, okay? It's they broken. Go back to Daniel chapter 2, to the uh, mystery Babylon image, and we're in the last epoch of that image. That is in the feet and the ten toes of iron mingled with clay and broken into pieces. We have a Roman Empire broken up as predicted by the scripture. There is no one world governing authority since the Roman Empire fell and broke up. So that the scripture, the word of God is absolutely correct. And that synopsis of the entire history until the consummation you can find there in Daniel chapter two, Read it for yourself. There is no mistake about it. The interpretation is sure, and uh, you, you cannot go wrong by sticking to that template for the history of the world. And immediately at the consummation is the return of Christ, and his kingdom strikes the image and abolishes it, and then his kingdom fills the whole earth. No mistake whatsoever. On the apocalyptic Babylon's meaning Rome, all agreed. Once more, as to the time of Antichrist's duration, though all reckoned it literally as three and a half years, how but for this could they have looked for Christ's coming as near? Yet very remarkably, the testimony of Cyprian and of his biographer was incidentally given, even thus early, to the year-day principle as a scriptural one all ready for its application to the prophetic chrono chronological periods at God's own fit time afterwards. The, the year-day application of the 1260 years was hidden. They all expected Christ to come soon. God in his wisdom 
hides what he wants to hide and he reveals it in his own time. And you'll see going through history, if you have something like the, the um, history unveiling prophecy or uh, the Hori Apocalyptica in its separate if different forms, you realize you'll see the dawning of the revelation and its meaning as, as time unfolds it and the meaning becomes evident in the history that is unfolding. That's a wonderful thing to see. And that's why, uh, our, you know, the churches, the evangelical and Protestant churches today are in the dark because they do not see, they are not exposed to the witness of the church in history. It's all hidden from them. Okay. As to the apocalyptic Judaic symbols, there seems to have been a general reference to them in this era to the Christian church or worship. So Irenaeus, Tertullian, Victorinus, Lactanitius expounded the apocalyptic temple and altar. So Tertullian, Methodius, Lactantius, the apocalyptic 144,000 sealed ones out of the 12 tribes and apocalyptic New Jerusalem, a point important to be marked in the primitive exposition. On which point, and the general subject of the intent of the scripture symbols and figures, we have to remember that Origen, already briefly noticed by me, lived and taught about the middle of the third century. And had he fulfilled his declar declared intention of giving the Christian world an apocalyptic commentary, we can scarcely doubt but that it would have been of a character more mystical than those we have yet had to do with. Though Victorinus's exposition of the symbols, a primary apocalyptic vision furnishes us indeed with a partial specimen. And we're going to have to pick up right here when we get back from these messages. You're listening to Cross the Border, our Prophecy Reality Edition, and we are going through history of apocalyptic interpretation. So stick around and we will continue. Don't go anywhere. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our listen and schedule pages on the internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app. 
for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border, Prophecy Reality Edition, and we are going through the history of apocalyptic interpretation uh, by E.B. Elliot. And uh, we're just going to jump right in and pick up where we left off. Okay, Origen's principle of analogical or spiritualizing exposition could not but have been largely applied by him to the apocalyptic prophecy, especially as one involving constantly symbolic language, besides those allusions to Babylon, Israel, Jerusalem, which we saw, were always, according to him, to be construed analogically in scripture. But this commentary he, in effect, did not write, and it remained for others fully to apply his principles to the apocalyptic exposition in a later era. On the millenary question, all primitive expositors except Origen and the few who rejected the revelation as non-apostolical were pre-millenarians and construed the first resurrection of the saints literally. Okay, we're moving on here to uh, period two. Constantine to the fall of the empire A.D. 476. The great Constantine revolution accomplished, as I before observed, just after Lactantius's publication of his institutions could hardly fail of exercising a considerable influence on apocalyptic interpretation, a revolution by which Christianity should be established in the prophetically denounced Roman Empire was an event the contingency of which had never occurred apparently to the previous exponents of Christian prophecy and suggested the idea of a mode, time, and scene of the fulfillment of the promises of the latter-day blessedness that could scarcely have been have arisen before. That its scene might be the earth in its present state not the renovated earth after Christ's coming and the conflagration. Its time, that of, of the present dispensation, its mode by the earthly establishment of the earthly church visible, for it does not seem to have occurred at the, at the time that this might in fact be one of the preparation through Satan's craft for the establishment after a while of the great predicted anti-Christian ecclesiastical empire on the platform of the same Roman world and in a professing but apostatized church. Eusebius, the first author of this era, seems in earlier life to have received the revelation as inspired scripture and interpreted its seals somewhat like Victorinus of the difficulties of Old Testament prophecy opened by Christ when the extraordinary Constantine revolution established itself, though doubts now commenced as to its apostolic authorship, yet he still continued to refer to its prophecies with an application changed, however, according with the change in the times. Thus he applied to this great event both Isaiah's promises of the latter day and also, as his language indicates, the apocalyptic prophecy of the New Jerusalem, at the same time that the symbolic vision of the seven-headed dragon of Revelation 7, cast down from heaven, was, with real exegetic correctness, as I conceive, applied to the dejection of paganism and the pagan emperors from their former, from their former supremacy in the Roman world. 
As regards Daniel's 70 weeks, let me add, Eusebius, like most of the expositors before him, explained them contiguously. But to carry out such views of the New Jerusalem must soon have been felt most difficult. The Arian and other troubles which quickly supervene, powerfully contributing to that conviction. It resulted perhaps not a little from this cause that the apocalypse itself became for a while much neglected, especially in the Eastern Empire, where the imperial seat was now chiefly fixed. There occur, however, passing notices directly or indirectly bearing on the apocalyptic interpretation in the writings of two chief champions of the orthodox Trinitarian faith in the East and the West. I mean, of course, Anathasius and Hilary, which must not be passed over in silence. 2. Anathasius In Anathasius, the main point to be marked is his strongly pronounced opinion respecting the Antichrist of prophecy that the heretical anti-Trinitarian ruler of the Roman Empire, like Constantius, would well answer to him, albeit making a Christian profession, and professedly in the Christian Church, thus in a general way, with reference to heretical leaders, he spoke of Antichrist coming with the profession, I am Christ, and assuming Christ's place and character, like Satan transformed into an angel of light. Then elsewhere, in particular, spoke by Constantius as the precursor of Antichrist, the image of Antichrist, nay, as every way answering to Antichrist. For what mark, said he, does Constantius lack of the Antichrist of prophecy? I may add that he too seems to have construed the 70 weeks of Daniel, like the majority of his predecessors in the Anticonstine age, as wholly fulfilled on the first coming of Jesus, the Holy One of Holies. For then, says he, the prophecy and the vision was sealed up, and the city and the temple taken. 3. Hilary, the Bishop of Poitiers in France, and contemporary and friend of Athanasius, and following particulars of the apocalyptic exposition, may be worth our notice. 1. Somewhat like Victorinus and Eusebius, he suggests the apocalyptic seven-sealed book, written within and without, signifying the various things predicted in Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets concerning Christ, and which were opened and revealed by Jesus, some already fulfilled when St. John was in Patmos, others yet unfulfilled in future. Moreover, he thus somewhat originally divides and classifies them, that is to say, as Christ's incarnation, death, resurrection, glory, on ascension to heaven, reign, and final judgment, of which septenary, he says, the first five had been opened to the world on Jesus' first coming. The rest would be open on his second coming. 2. To the Jewish symbols in Scripture prophecy, he supposed generally that a Christian sense attached. So, more particularly, with regard to the New Jerusalem of Revelation 21 and 22, also as also to the Zion, Jerusalem, Israel, and temple of the prophecies of the Old Testament. 3. On the subject of Antichrist, he stated in a treatise written before the year 356, and when the West had been comparatively undisturbed by the violent aggression of Arianism, that he predicted abomination, uh, that the predicted abomination of desolation was meant of a future Antichrist, the term abomination having reference to Antichrist appropriating to himself the honor due to God, as after reception by the Jews. He sat in the Jewish holy place or temple, that of desolation to his foreseen desolations of the once holy land and place by war and slaughter. Moreover, he expressed his opinion that Moses and Elias, the same that appeared to Christ in the Transfiguration, would be the two witnesses figured in the apocalyptic prophecy as slain by Antichrist. A little later, after the flood of Arianism had swept, through, had swept with violence into the western part of, Rome, of the Roman Empire, the idea of Antichrist with the professing church forced 
itself on his mind, just as on that of Anathasius. Writing in 364 against Oxtentius, the Arian Archbishop of Milan, he exclaims, Is it a thing doubtful that Antichrist will sit in Christian churches? And both there and in his treatise, De Trinite, uh, written a little before 360, during his exile, he both denounces the Emperor Const Constantius as a precursor of Antichrist and directly designates the Bishop Arius and the Bishop Oxtentius as Antichrists. 4. While commenting on the Transfiguration, after six days, Jesus takes Peter and John, and etc., Hiller refers to the old idea of a seventh sabbatical millinery, saying that as Christ was transfigured in glory after the six days, so the world, six thousand years, there would be manifested the glory of Christ's eternal kingdom. His great subject led him often to speak of the day and hour of the consummation being known to no man. But this fact, considering the measure of doubtfulness attaching to our world's chronology, and that means at the time they seemed to have no idea how many years had passed since the creation, many believing they were nearing the end of the sixth millennium. And I have a post on my website about that, if you're interested, called What Year Is It? And we go through the entire Bible and we show you the chronology that God had had written into the scripture all the time, hidden there, uh, now exposed for us who are near the end, uh, actually near the end of the sixth millennium as to that uh, chronology in the Bible, no longer hidden. So go to my website, crosstheborder.org, and simply search for the, the uh, posting there, what year is it? Let us continue. Hiller refers to the old idea of a seventh sabbatical millenary, saying that as Christ was transfigured in glory after six days, so the world six thousand years, there would be manifested the glory of Christ's eternal kingdom. His great subject led him often to speak of the day and hour of the consummation being known to no man. But this fact, considering the measure of doubtfulness attaching to a world's chronology, he did not regard as militating against the idea. 4. Cyril, Ephraim Cyrus, and Chrysostom. Turning to the east again, a very passing notice will suffice of the Eastern Church's three latter patristic expositors of the 4th century, Cyril, Ephraim, Cyrus, and Chrysostom, since Though acknowledging the revelation as inspired, they made but little use of it. As regards Cyril of Jerusalem, I may observe that with reference to the expected Antichrist, he distinctly coupled together the two ideas of this being a ruler of the Roman Empire, in fact the eighth head of the apocalyptic beast, and his assuming to himself the title of Christ, this man will usurp the government of the Roman Empire and will falsely call himself the Christ. But in what temple would he sit? The Jewish rebuilt temple or Christian professing churches? That of the Jews. But why? Because God forbid that the temple meant should be that in which we now are. Of course, he would be speaking of the Christian church. Such was Cyril's only reason against the latter view of the temple meant by St. Paul's prophecy to the Thessalonians. This Antichrist, Cyril Judge, was not to be Daniel's abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. With regard to his contemporary Ephraim Cyrus, we may remark that he, like Hillary, noted how the wicked one, Antichrist, when come, would not cease to make inquisition for the saints by land and sea, they seeking safety meanwhile in monasteries and deserts, the two witnesses, Elijah and Enoch, preceding him, and on the Roman Empire's fall, Antichrist and the consummation. As to Chrysostom, he judged that the temple of Antichrist's enthronement would be not that which is in Jerusalem, but the Christian church. 
And so he actually believed what Paul wrote in his epistles about the Christian church being the temple of God. I am in agreement with that. Quote, he will not invite men to worship idols, but will be himself an anti-theos, or anti-Christ or anti-God, he said. He will put down all gods and will command, command men to worship him as the very God. Yes, yeah, so maybe they will call him something like the Holy Father. What do you think? <laughs> and he will sit in the temple of God, not that which is in Jerusalem, but in the churches everywhere. Wow, what a revelation for a 4th century uh, Christian there. Okay, well, I think, I think Paul wrote it plainly in his epistles, so uh, let us get our revelation like uh, Chrysostom did here. I guess that was Chrysostom, yeah, did, uh, directly from the scripture itself. Yes and amen. Now it is time to turn westward to Jerome and Augustine, those eminent expositors of the Latin church, who, unlike the Greek fathers of the age, not only recognized the Revelation as a divine book, but continually referred to it, and in their passing notices on apocalyptic interpretation, threw out hints of much importance, and on more than one point, with great and lasting influence. 5. Jerome 1. According to this father of the church, the Revelation was a book that had in it as many mysteries as words, while sundry particular words had each in them a multifold meaning, and that the Revelation was to be all spiritually understood because otherwise Judaic fables must be acquiesced, in such as those that the rebuilding of Jerusalem and a revival of its temple of carnal rites and ordinances, in regard, however, of which his spiritual or figurative understanding of the revelation, we should remember the check urged by Jerome himself against any undue license of fancy, at least in explaining the Old Testament so as by those who, with, uh, and he goes on here to uh, expound some Latin. Um, yes, E.B. Eliot did that once, so I just throw some Latin in there, and I guess I should have looked it up beforehand. Maybe it's in the, uh, in the footnotes there. Let me see. Ah, spiritualize away the truth of history. So there it is. So, so as by those who, with, it spiritualize church history. There you go. Uh, two, the apocalyptic 144,000 seen by St. John with Christ on Mount Zion or sealed ones out of each and all of the tribes of the apocalyptic Israel are sometimes expounded by Jerome as the Christian apostles, martyrs, and saints generally, sometimes of Christian virgins or celibates, more especially, never of an election distinctly out of Jews or natural Israel. Three, as regards the two apocalyptic witnesses, though he has not given us his own opinion as to who or what made up his opinion about them, yet negatively he has pretty clearly intimated that in his judgment they were not Enoch or Elias, cautioning his questioning on the point, the noble Roman lady Marcella, in a passage already for, referred to by me against expounding the revelation otherwise than as a book which is to be understood spiritually or figuratively. Because we are running out of time. So we'll continue with Jerome's exposition of the apocalyptic interpretation next time on Cross the Border, our Prophecy Reality Edition. We'll see you next time. May the Almighty bless you each and every day. Until then.
Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border org c r o s s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org